Hey guys, it's your boy Nell. Um, here with Dr. Ramba. I had to do an interview for a class, a communications class, but I think it's really good information. He's a chiropractor here in the Quad Cities, and he was nice enough to let me record it. So here it is. Hope you enjoy it. Well, and I thought too, you know, you being at Palmer and being a healthcare professional, you're going to have a more skeptical scientific viewpoint than the average uh, Joe bodybuilder who mm -hmm. might, might just be reading magazines and being swayed by a lot of, you know, sensationalism that doesn't really, and doesn't really have the background, although I would imagine a lot of really elite bodybuilders do have a lot of knowledge mm -hmm. and, and they're just not you know, going with everything that's been written. Well, and that's great that you have that fitness background because from, from the standpoint of chiropractic, when it comes to spinal health, the, the cornerstone of everything has to be fitness. You mm -hmm. know, if, you know, as far as chiropractors, if we're just adjusting people all the time, but they're not following a good fitness regimen, exercising, doing all the right things, they're not going to be healthy, you right. know, and so uh, so I'm always talking about to patients about fitness and exercise and losing weight, you know, because if they did that, a lot of my patients wouldn't be here. It's probably bad for business, right. but the reality is, you know, it's our responsibility to teach them how to help themselves. What do you do for patient education? Like, do you do uh, booklets or handout information? No, or just I used to. I mean, but you know, maybe it's a bad it's it's a bad area to begin with, but I'm kind of at the end of it. I have an established practice and mm -hmm. I just basically talk to people all the time. You know, I'm constantly, when I get new patients, we always go over their diet, we always go over their their exercise and their lifestyles, mm -hmm. and we always incorporate that into everything we, we, we discuss with them. So, but in the beginning, yes, I would give out pamphlets. I mean, uh, you know, we would give out educational materials, uh, you know, use some of the stuff that was out there with the standard you know, years ago, with some of the Parker stuff. Mm -hmm. um, then Palmer had some stuff that we would use. Um, but I've, I really don't do that anymore because I basically just have an established practice and I just continually talk to people. So, um, so I've really gotten away from giving a lot of patient information. How long have you been practicing? 37 years. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I started yeah. October 1st of 1979. Yeah. And you graduated from Palmer? From Palmer, yeah. yeah I went to University of Wisconsin in La Crosse, did my two years um, pre-chiropractic there, and I was actually interested in physical therapy or some sort of health, but I didn't really know which way to go. Mm -hmm. And I was on the track team. I was a sprinter and a javelin thrower, and I was having a lot of issues with my back. And I was going to physical therapy, and you know they were giving me exercises, and it was helping to some extent, mm -hmm. but it really didn't make a huge difference and finally a friend of mine says why don't you try a chiropractor and the chiropractor I went to was Dr. Fred Barge I think a lot of you guys oh, yeah. have probably heard of Fred Barge mm -hmm. and he you know I told Dr. Barge about I was interested in healthcare, and I didn't know anything about chiropractic but I was thinking about physical therapy and that was the door open for him because he was a real promoter to get students yeah. to come to Palmer so he basically said come see me and he says let me check you out and he says it'll be free of charge so he gave it to me for no cost he x-rayed me he discussed how the spine works and he adjusted me and it was an amazing experience and right then is when I decided this is what I think I want to do so that's what got me into it then there was a Palmer career day he took me here and we went through the program and then I decided that's where I wanted to be so after my two years of lacrosse I came to Palmer, and back then it was three years to get through. So when I graduated, I was 23, and I'm 60 oh, yeah. now. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Primarily Palmer package. Okay. Uh, I started out being uh, probably a little more hardcore Gonstead, mm -hmm. and uh, but I always have used utilized Palmer package, and so I pretty much adapt the techniques to what the patients need, and I've kind of moved away from being strict Gonstead to pretty much just being Palmer package, which. Obviously, you've got the Thompson, the Gonstead, the um, you know the, the basically diversified moves, and I just pick and choose what I think is going to be best for the patients because I found that I don't think one technique is the you know best technique. The best technique is you know whatever breaks up the fixations in the spine, and whatever works best for you is what we use. So that's your that was one of my questions. Yeah. What's your philosophy? That's whatever. my philosophy. Yeah. I've been always more of a standard um, osseous manual type of adjuster. I do utilize some activator in my practice, but I don't follow the classic activator protocol. Yeah. I will use the activator on patients in lieu of a manual adjustment, mm -hmm. but um, I have a tendency to use that on basically just very um, 
older patients that can't handle the traditional adjustment. Right. I guess I'm just kind of old school and yeah. like the hands-on, you know, uh, yeah. manual type of approach. Right. That's exactly what I was doing in the AUC. So oh, I like that, like this guy. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's yeah. I mean, there for a while we did use some modalities. Uh, I, I I did use some e stem at times, and I used some ultrasound at times. But um, I, I have a tendency to move away from that, that um, passive type of care, and I basically get people more on simple active type protocols. I will go over some exercises with them, mm -hmm. you know, I adjust them to get them moving, and you usually have them use ice or heat at home, uh, and I've really moved away from a lot of the modalities, just because I think mostly they're feel-good therapies, um, and, and they don't really do a whole lot um, in my view, uh, yeah. rather than what ice or heat could do. And, you know, from an insurance standpoint, I mean, a lot of the scientific evidence now has basically moved away from modalities, and when you get into insurance reimbursements, they're either not approving them or they're paying them at such a reduced rate, so it's really not that cost-effective to use them anymore. Yeah. So, uh, not that we ever utilized them a lot. I said e even when we did use them, they probably only made up less than 5% of my practice, and it's not that I'm anti the use of therapy, but I just never found them to be overly effective yeah. to that, although <laughs> uh, I've got nothing against it, and I think it's another avenue that, uh, as a provider, you can use to you know, help the patient recover but I, I've always been just pretty much uh, adjusting, exercise, lifestyle changes, and try to get them into a fitness uh, uh, you know, role where they can do it on their own and mm -hmm. become less dependent on me. Mm -hmm. um, so. So and really I think it's, it's worked well because I think people trust me and they know that when I recommend something, I'm doing it for their best interest and not for just my interest. Yeah. yeah. You're answering my questions as you go. Okay. <laughs> so okay. I say, all right, now what do I have since you already answered it? But um, so you really ca put care into the patient, you know, patient care, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you're more about getting the patient better mm -hmm. and not uh, so you need 50 adjustments in order right. to be better. That's yeah. the one thing that always bothered me when I first got into this profession was um, some of the practice management type of protocols where you know, you set these patients up on these long-term programs and some of these people say what you want to do is you want to look at your patient case average, meaning how much money are you extracting from each patient. Mm -hmm. And I always didn't like that. I thought that, you know, even when you go back to the early days of chiropractic, B.J. Palmer and D.D. Palmer were always proud that they would get a patient fixed up with two or three adjustments. And somewhere along the line we got into this, we have to see them 50 or 60 times. Sure. Um, and I'm not saying that some patients don't require chronic maintenance care, but uh, you know, not everybody requires 50 visits. And uh, I think most of the evidence shows that uh, patients should respond, you know, fairly well within the first one to two months. You probably wouldn't. I don't want to put case averages on it, but most people should feel considerably better within six to 12 visits. And if they're taking more than that, then you have to say what's going on. Why do we need to keep adjusting them. So, you know, patients are busy, they don't want to keep coming to see you all the time, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't like to have patients not get better. So, um, as like Golden Constance said, find it, fix it, leave it alone. And that's always been my model. Mm -hmm. So, And I think it's worked well because then patients begin to trust you and uh, they're comfortable with you, and then when they start referring you patients, um, well, you know, in this area too, I mean, there are so many chiropractors here that, that, that um, patients um, really are educated towards that. So one of the first things patients start coming in, they have this guard of, are you gonna have me come 50 times? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's nice that now when patients come, they know they've been referred by other patients who know that's not gonna happen to them here. So, uh, but um, I, I think that we have a responsibility to fix people up as quickly as possible and transition them to self-help care so they don't become dependent on us for their care all the time. And you know, you talk about some therapy, I mean, that's where I do think that there's some effectiveness with, with modalities too, as you're treating patients. I mean, sometimes there's no doubt about that using ultrasound to DP the tissue or maybe use some e-stim to help relax the muscles. So I definitely, if you're getting into more of a, a sports type of practice and you're working with soft tissues, uh, like I said before, I don't use the, uh, the therapies, but there's definitely a place for them. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, but we again, we just see them being used less and less all through healthcare. Even even my experience with a lot of my patients that have or go to physical therapy, even the modality uses within the physical therapy profession have been much more um, 
you know, curtailed back. Uh, again, because the scientific evidence doesn't, you know, support it, and um, other than a feel-good therapy, mm -hmm. and uh, reimbursement levels are so low on them now that many times it just is not cost-effective to be using that stuff anymore. But I, I do think they have their place as a complement to everything else. But as a standalone treatment with nothing else, mm -hmm. then I think you're doing the patient a disservice. They can go home and just put some heat and ice and essentially do the same thing. Uh, do you uh, x-ray here? I used to x-ray. We do have an x-ray machine. Mm -hmm. I used to x-ray a lot more than what I do now. I've really moved away from it uh, just because uh, I do follow some of the more recent guidelines that um, basically in the absence of red flags, um, you know, x-rays are not really um, necessary. Now there, oh, there's this big debate about measuring x-rays for subluxations and, mm -hmm. and that type of stuff. But I've never really found, uh, over the years, I've found that whether I x-ray a patient or not, um, I always seem to pretty much get about the same results. And uh, again, a lot of the findings that we see on x-rays don't necessarily correlate a lot of times with, um, with, with what the patient presents with. Uh, you can have an x-ray that looks beautiful and yet the patient can have all kinds of trouble. And then x-rays that look like deteriorated roadmaps, and yeah, the patients and really aren't that fine. bad. Yeah. So I think that I've, um, I've definitely moved away from that because I, I, there again, I don't want to give patients radiation if they don't need them. Um, you know, from a practice management standpoint, x-rays used to be fairly profitable, but now too, with um, insurance companies knowing these guidelines, um, and, and basically they're reducing their um, reimbursements on x-rays to the points where it's really not extremely cost-effective and as a new practitioner to go out and buy a brand new digital x-ray machine which is the standard now and they take beautiful pictures and they are nice to have but um, you know it, it would take you a long time to recoup that money and mm -hmm. now a lot of different um, x-ray facilities are more than happy to take your referrals so it seems to me that it is moving away from that, um, and I have definitely moved away from it, and I don't x-ray nearly as much as I once did. And did you do it more when you were practicing Gonstead? Yeah, That's primarily right. since I was more of a Gonstead type of mind, mm -hmm. and then also, you know, since Fred Barge was somewhat of a mentor of mine, Fred Barge was also really big into the x-ray analysis and measurements of rotations of the vertebra, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, the basically using that to gauge, you know, your treatments and your adjustments. And um, I, I, but again, that was 37 years ago, and I think we've seen a lot of that type evolved, of thought process you know, has yeah. evolved. You yeah. know, where again, it's more, uh, you know, in my experience, I think it's more fixated stuck joints than it is the old bone out of place theory. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at that, I think it's hard to justify routinely X-raying a lot of people. I know she had mentioned to me that you were kind of interested in trying to incorporate a, a fitness type of, um, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, plan with, um, to like set up a gym yes. uh, with your, um, yeah, I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Uh, I think too, you know, from a standpoint of, uh, yeah, and, so, yeah. I, and I think uh, th there's definitely a need for that, and uh, you know, if an area is, uh, it, it can be a nice supplement to like a cash flow into your office, mm -hmm. um, along with just your general chiropractic treatment too. Yeah, you know, I think uh, there's all kinds of opportunities, um, you know, uh, of course here in the Quad Cities, I think everybody realizes you know how much more difficult it is because there's quite a concentration of chiropractors mm -hmm. here. I mean, when I started, um, if you went around the block here, there were three of us, and now there's I counted the other day there's, there's every there's corner fifteen. In fact, right around the corner here, I think there's a, 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 a guy named Mark Schmall, Dr. Mark Schmall, and he's set up kind of a, a little rehab, but he's also set up health food store next to his office too. Yeah. So so I think a lot of people are branching out into the health market and trying to do other things to bring cash into their offices and have supplement businesses that complement their practices mm -hmm. and I think that's a good idea too. And, uh, but my roommate from Palmer, uh, he just retired and his two sons took over the practice but he had built a huge clinic and did extremely well up in Beaver Dam, Wisconsin but he ended up getting a lot of insurance contracts. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when we first started, there was no insurance. And then um, insurance uh, came into being, and then insurance started paying extremely, 
things very well. That's they refer to it the Mercedes 80s era. Oh, yeah. And uh, then everything you build, insurance paid, there were no fee cuts. And then managed care came in. And then you had to sign up for these programs and they started reducing your fees. And then we're all dealing with that now. But he managed to get into a situation where he was, he was well known in town. And when managed care came in, basically these companies came to him and said, we want you to be our provider. And once these panels were filled with two or three chiropractors, they shut them off and nobody could get in. And that's the way Wisconsin has worked. And so Bill, my, for my roommate, he managed to be one of the only chiropractors in the county that was on this panel. So he just has new patients flocking in yeah. like crazy. So from him to his instance, in his environment, the insurance has worked extremely well. But other chiropractors in this town are struggling because they can't get into the insurance because they've closed the panels off. Did so, you start on your own when you graduated? Or did you? Um, no, actually, um, I came in. There was a chiropractor in this building, uh, Dr. Glenn Benner, and he'd been in the area for uh, 40 some years. Yeah. And uh, so he was looking for an associate, and so I came in with him, and uh, we just worked together, and we had the same philosophies and ideas. And so after a couple of years, we just kind of came to the decision that I would eventually buy him out. So we worked together for about four or five years, and then I bought his practice in the building and the real estate and everything. And so took over a, 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 a successful practice and then just continued to work with it over the years. So, you know, and it, it worked out. I mean, it was a pretty uh, pretty big investment, but then you had something to work with, too. Uh, and again, uh, it was it was a different era where there wasn't as, I would say that the, the uh, Quad City area has always been somewhat competitive, mm -hmm. but the fact is the area has always been also very educated towards chiropractic too. So, um, so it was very it did very well for for a long time, uh, and it still does. But uh, you know, I've just it's, I'm just kind of working three and a half days a week. I've kind of scaled back and don't really want to push like I once did. Mm -hmm. uh, I just have kind of I love what I do, but I I've, I've kind of um, lost that drive to build big business. Mm -hmm. I just enjoy taking care of the patients and then, you know, there's other things in life for me now outside of chiropractic.